well. Good evening and welcome to tonight's event, uh, Discovering a Forgery, Jupiter's Real Moons and U of M's Fake Galileo Manuscript. I'm Gary Krenz, director of the observatory, uh, but please don't mistake me for an astronomer. Uh, that's Austin's job. You might have met him out, uh, out in the hall uh, as you came in. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome both our online audience uh, participating on YouTube and all of you uh, here in the room at the historic Judy and Stanley Frankel Detroit Observatory. And I'm also thrilled to be working with the U of M Library on tonight's very special program. And I want to thank Pablo Alvarez and Nick Wilding for being here. Before we get started, I want to say that the Detroit Observatory is a division of the Bentley Historical Library. And as the archives of the University of Michigan, the Bentley Library acknowledges that the historical origins and present locations of the university were made possible by cession of lands by Anishinaabe and Wyandotte peoples under coercive treaties common in the colonization and expansion of the United States. We note in particular the, land, the grant of land made by the Anishinaabe under the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids for the, quote, college at Detroit, which was where U of M was founded, so that their children could be educated. These lands continue to be the homeland of indigenous people, and we seek to reaffirm and respect their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and to recognize their contributions to the university. Now, when I first read of the discovery of this forgery, I was, of course, taken aback, as I'm sure many of you were. Uh, but I was also uplifted by the library's handling of it, as I'm sure some of you were as well. We frankly don't get many opportunities to see so publicly in action the fundamental intellectual values of a university, values which, we might say, also informed the work of Galileo himself and others in his era. So that is what we're going to be discussing tonight. And I'm going to introduce our guests and then make a few remarks about the relationship of this manuscript to the history of the Detroit uh, Observatory. Nick Wilding is an historian of early modern Europe, the history of science and the history of the book. He is the author of two books, Galileo's Idol, Gianfrancesco Sagredo and the Politics of Knowledge, and Falsea de Lune, as well as a dozen book and journal articles. He has held fellowships at the Medici Archive Project, Stanford, Cambridge, Columbia, the American Academy in Rome, uh, the New York Academy of Medicine, and the Rare Book School. His current, his current research on book for forgery has been featured in the New York Times, as I'm sure some of you have seen, and the New Yorker. Pablo Alvarez came to the Special Collections Research Center at the University of Michigan Library in 2010 from the University of Rochester, where he was curator of rare books and taught the history of the book. As curator at the SCRC, his primary responsibility is to promote the use of manuscripts and early printed books, up to 1700, to students, faculty, and the community at large. He is the author of the edition and English translation of the 17th century printing manual, Institución y Organ del Arte de la Imprenta y Reglas Generales para los Componedores. Please pardon my poor pronunciation. Uh, which was published by the Legacy Press in 2018. So welcome and thank you both for being here. So, in 1610, Galileo pointed his telescope, a recent invention, at the planet Jupiter and after observing over the course of several nights, concluded that there were moons orbiting the planet. This was an observation that would, with others, eventually help confirm the Copernican model of the solar system. Now, we're in an observatory, or at least we're attached to an observatory, which is just up the stairs. So I want to say a few things about uh, Galileo's telescope. Uh, the telescope he used to observe Jupiter had an aperture of about one inch. Right, one inch, there's one inch right there. After this, if you go upstairs to the dome of this observatory, you will see the Fitz, Henry Fitz telescope up there, which has an aperture of 12 and a half inches. Okay, so there's 12 and, 12 and 3 eighths to be precise. But, uh, so anyway, Galileo was dealing with a pretty small telescope, but still, uh, it's an improvement on the human eye, which even in the dark, uh, will dilate to about a third of an inch. Right? Uh, we have here, out in the hall, or it was out in the hall, a telescope that approximates Galileo's telescope. And although the weather is probably not going to let us look at Jupiter tonight, 
Uh, Austin and his docents have set up some simulations, and you, you can get sort of an idea uh, afterwards about, uh, about what Galileo might have, been, uh, might have been looking at. Now, what really matters uh, the most about a telescope is its aperture, right? The diameter of the, of the lens on the, on the front end of the telescope. Uh, that's more important than the, uh, than the magnification uh, in, in many respects. Uh, because the aperture of the telescope determines how much light can be taken in by the telescope. So just like when we go into a dark space, our eyes dilate, increasing the aperture of our pupil to let in more light, this is the idea behind a telescope. The bigger the, bigger the aperture, uh, the more light that telescope can take in. So the light gathering power of that telescope up in the dome is about 38 times the light gathering power of Galileo's telescope. And if we want to make even a more recent comparison, uh, the new James Webb Space Telescope uh, has a light gathering power about 16,000 times that of Galileo's telescope. Not to mention the fact that it's out there in space so it doesn't have atmospheric disturbances to deal with and it can see light in wavelengths well beyond the visible spectrum. In any case, uh, Galileo did pretty well with his, little, uh, with his little telescope, and all of this is to say that Galileo stands at the very beginning of a centuries-long development of technology for observing the heavens. And the most fundamental thing about that technology is unchanged. Over that entire period of time, it's all about capturing light. Right? At the beginning of this peri uh, uh, period, his uh, accomplishments were quite remarkable. We know that he published his observations in a book we have here, we have here tonight, uh, the Sidereal Nuncius. But before that, he presumably recorded his observations in various logs and drafts, right? Nobody goes directly from observation to publication, not now and not then either. So let's fast forward 328 years to September 1938, because that is really the proximate start of the story we're gonna be talking about tonight. And here I want to thank Andrew Rutledge, uh, who's monitoring YouTube for us, but also who did some, uh, some great research on this uh, in a short amount of time. So in, the in, in 1938, September 14th to 17th, to be exact, the American Astronomical Society held its 60th annual meeting here at the University of Michigan. The director of the University Observatory and the chair of astronomy uh, at that time was Heber Curtis famous for his part in the Shapley-Curtis debate about the size, of the size and structure of the universe. And we can talk more, a little bit more about that later, but there's gonna be more about Heber in just a moment. In any case, there were the usual proceedings of papers and talks, and also, of course, like at any conference, at least any pre-COVID conference, right? Lots of ancillary activities, receptions, dinners, a tour of the university's observatory, which at that time including the building included the building upstairs, a director's residence to the west, which is no longer there, and a large dome with a 37 and a half inch telescope, more or less where we are right now. But that also, sadly, was torn down uh, in the 1970s. Now, one of the things that the audience, that the attendees of that conference were thrilled to see, this is according to the report of the event, in popular science, because back then, uh, science proceedings got sort of published in popular science, was a new 98-inch diameter glass disc manufactured by Corning Glass to be turned into a mirror for a reflecting telescope that had been designed by Heber Curtis. The plan was to install that telescope in a new observatory about 40 miles from Ann Arbor away from the light pollution and the smoke pollution from the power plant of Ann Arbor. Right? The funding for that mirror had been provided by Tracy McGregor, a Detroit-based prog progressive activist and philanthropist, the co-founder uh, co of the McGregor Fund, which still exists as a powerful foundation supporting social welfare activities in Southeast Michigan and beyond. McGregor had also funded some other astronomy projects related to Michigan, which we can get into later if time permits. So what does this have to do with our story tonight? Well, sadly, Tracy McGregor uh, died suddenly in 1936, two years before that American Astronomical Society meeting. 
and before he could see the mirror installed in a telescope. But his foundation remained active, and its trustees included the amateur astronomers Francis McMath and Henry Hulbert of the U of M affiliated McMath Hulbert Observatory. And their story in itself is fascinating. In any event, at this meeting in 1938, Judge Hulbert, on behalf of the McGregor Fund trustees, gave to the University of Michigan, and I quote from the report of the meeting, quote, a copy of the first edition of Copernicus, a copy of the first edition of Galileo, also an original letter from Galileo to Prince de Medici relative to his newly constructed telescope and discoveries by it. These were given to the university for, quote, its astronomical libraries in special recognition of the services astro to astronomy by Professor Heber D. Curtis and as a mark of the esteem felt for him by McGregor. So there we have it, a manuscript of Galileo's notes leading to the publication of the discovery of moons of Jupiter given to the University of Michigan almost on this very spot and becoming what we thought was one of the great treasures of the university library holdings. And with that, there's really nothing left to say but to turn it over to Nick. Good. Hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, and thank you to the university in general for behaving uh, in what's really an exemplary manner. Um, I'd just like to say from the get-go that uh, I'll be doing this presentation, but it, this uh, is a, uh, a duet or a co-authored piece with, with Pablo. So I'll, first of all, I'll give you a little bit of background about um, a little bit more about Galileo and early telescopes. And then we'll get into the heavily visual material of the, um, the de-authentication process, plot spoiler number one, uh, of uh, how we got to work out that this document, um, it's here, it's really here uh, in a fake way, um, <laughs> is, is not what it uh, has always been believed to be. So as you just heard, uh, in 1609, Galileo got hold of probably not an actual telescope or a spyglass, but a rumor of one, and managed to kind of retro-engineer his own, and then work at the lens grinding and make a more and more powerful uh, instrument. This is one of uh, two surviving telescopes, both in Florence and the Museo Galileo. Um, very, very quickly, within the space of about four or five months, he had uh, made a series of quite stunning astronomical discoveries. Uh, he, he hadn't at this point discovered everything that could be discovered with a uh, low-powered telescope, but he discovered uh, most, of, most of what could be discovered and about half of what he would uh, discover. He hasn't yet discovered sunspots. They would be the next year. So the Sidereus Nuncius, and there's a, a copy of this, this book, published uh, in May 1610 in Venice in 550 copies. This is one of about 103 that survive now. Um, very, very lovely, my, my favorite book in the world. Um, the Sidereus Nuncius made the following uh, claims. So Galileo Galileo, I can uh, mouse and you can see what we're looking at. Uh, Florentine posh guy, uh, teacher at the uh, Paduan University with his telescope, sees things that no one else has ever seen uh, on the face of the moon. So what he sees there is that the moon has mountains, much like the Earth. So this makes him think that the moon is made of stuff like the Earth and not made out of green cheese or the quintessence, the mysterious uh, substance that doesn't exist on the Earth that everything in the Aristotelian universe above the moon is supposed to be made of, but is, ver is actually made of rocks uh, like our rocks. Um, he sees innumerable fixed stars, so he's hinting that the universe might be infinitely large. Very, very dangerous idea. Um, 
if the universe is infinitely large, every possible course of action has and will take place in it. And um, quite important events in early modern Europe, especially in Catholic Italy, such as the incarnation of Christ, would have had to have happened uh, an infinite number of times with an infinite number of different results. Uh, in an infinite number of crucifixions, Jesus just got down and said, I've had enough. And then in an infinite other number, he caught fire, etc. So that's a, a kind of weird thing to say. Gi Giordano Bruno had just been burnt at the stake, not for precisely that heresy, but for others. But it's a dangerous thing, uh, idea in the air. He'd also seen that the Milky Way wasn't some weird milky stuff, but was actually lots and lots of stars. Um, he wasn't so good at looking at nebulae. He thought that all nebulae could be uh, reduced to smaller and smaller stars that had never been seen. But the big typographic um, and intellectual fact of the, the book is four planets going around Jupiter with different um, intervals and different periods and moving with amazing speed, which nobody before the author has ever seen. And I get to call them, as I'm the discoverer, the Medician stars. So they're a gift to the Medici family. This is a very long job application, and it's a successful job application. He gets transferred out of his quite nice, cushy job in free-thinking Padua, next to the Republic of Venice, uh, to Florence, where, but he doesn't have to teach, which for any university professor is the dream job. <laughs> I'm kidding, I love teaching. Um, the book, bizarrely, and uh, not uniquely, but quite rarely for a 17th century text, um, exists both in its printed form and in its preparatory notes. If you compare that with, sh with contemporaries like Shakespeare, we, don't have, we have maybe half a shred of Shakespeare, but we don't have the draft of King Lear like should, it, should I say this? Or the, there's, there's nothing like that for most contemporary authors. For Galileo, we have the working uh, draft. And you can see it's full of crossings outs and insertions and little signs where he's putting the manuscript together. And really remarkably, this is not just the author's messy draft. It's also the copy that the printer of this book used to compose the text. There are little marks put in by the printer saying, Page seven finishes here. Start, this is where uh, page or folio eight starts getting set. So it's a, just kind of in the, within the history of type and, and printing, it's a remarkable document to have, let alone to have it for such an important book. Um, the first half of the book talks about those first three uh, things. There being mountains on the moon, there being loads and loads of stars, the Milky Way being different when you look at it through a telescope. And the entire second half of the book is concerned with the big new discovery, four new planets. Nobody had ever discovered planets before. I mean, they're not planets in our sense, but planet just means a moving star. So it's not a comet, it's not a fixed star, must be a planet. Um, there isn't yet a word. We don't have a word, satellite, which is actually bodyguard. Kepler's going to come up with that a few months later. Uh, so this is a, an object seeking an identity, an epistemological identity, but also a terminological identity. Um, here's the bibliographical description. It's a quarto book, so each sheet gets folded and folded again. Uh, the first half of the book runs quite normally, single sheets folded. Uh, as we get to the middle of the book, uh, this D6 means that there's an extra half sheet added. As Galileo finds out new stuff, he has to um, add that in. And then the second half of the book uh, runs again with single sheets uh, folded. So we know that the book was printed um, from the almost the start uh, and from the middle simultaneously. And then a bit was added kind of in the, in the, the middle as he went along. But basically, the important point is half the book is about the satellites of Jupiter. In his um, draft copy, so this is a manuscript that's in Florence, and I'll refer to it as the Sidereus Nuncius uh, dossier. This is what his observations look like. The first mention of this uh, discovery, although it's not yet a real thing, it's just uh, a question mark, is in a letter which has only recently resurfaced in the Gregorian University archives in Rome. 
in the correspondence of the great Jesuit astronomer Christoph Clavius. Uh, and this copy I've just worked out a few weeks ago is actually in the hand of one of Galileo's correspondents. We've often thought that this was just a later scribal copy, but this is basically Galileo wrote to one of his Venetian friends with the intention that he immediately send this to Rome to the Jesuits, the most important scientists in, in Europe at this point, point in time, for them to verify his findings. And it's also a kind of priority claim. And what he sees in this letter, so this is dated the 7th of January 1610, and probably this copy was um, made within a few days of that. What we see there is... Uh, if I translate on the fly, Giove è accompagnato da tre stelle fisse, uh, Jupiter ac uh, accompanied, I did live in Italy for several years, I didn't just learn that off uh, to, to sound fancy, I do speak the lingo. Um, uh, and it looks uh, invisible, it goes off the, off the screen here, invisible to human eyes, uh, but with the telescope it looks like this, um, star, star, Jupiter, star. So this is his first recognition that there's something next to Jupiter um, which he's not expecting to, uh, to be there. Uh, it's not yet anything to be too concerned about because it only becomes something to be concerned about when it's repeated over, when that observation is repeated over the course of several nights and he realizes that these stars near Jupiter keep moving with Jupiter. So they're not fixed stars in the background. There's something that's hanging on to Jupiter. And that's something that can't exist in the world as it's conceived at this point in time. Right? In the geocentric universe, um, everything is going around the world by definition. So you can't have uh, other things going around other things. It just is physically impossible. Here we are with the crux of the problem. On the left, we have the Sidereus Nuncius um, dossier. And on the right, we have this document, the Ann Arbor document. And there is some uh, considerable overlap between these two documents. So one has to be written first, but the information is more or less the same. So there's been debate about which one comes first um, and what's the relationship be between them. The basic form of the Ann Arbor document, so this is the first page of it, is uh, Adi Sette di Gennaio, 1610. Um, on the 7th of January, 1610, Jupiter uh, looks like this with three fixed stars, much the same as that letter that he wrote on the, on the 7th of January, and it looks like this. And then he goes through night by night, apart from when it's cloudy, and then he says it's cloudy, and says what he sees. And he does it all in Italian, because these are just kind of notes to self. When you flip the page and get onto the back of the page, suddenly it changes to Latin because he seems to realize he's onto something that is going to uh, require international communication. This is a big deal. This is a revolutionary document he's writing. If we look at the Ann Arbor document, we'll see very similar forms. I've uh, spliced it in here. Um, very, very similar. There are slightly different uh, letter forms, but the basic content of the text looks as though it's the same kind of set of observations. On the 7th of January, Jupiter looked like this, blah, blah, blah. There's the sign of Jupiter to make it extra clear. It's there in the original as well, or in the, the Florence one. I shouldn't uh, prejudge these things. And on the 8th, it looks like this, etc. So historians have generally said um, that the Ann Arbor document is probably the first one and that the Florence one is a kind of rewrite where these uh, these notes that are written on scraps of paper take form, become fleshed out a little bit, and become the draft of what will then, in Latin, become the Sidereus Nuncius. So here on the table we have the revolutionary manifesto, the raw data, the scientific revolution in a single beautifully photogenic document. Problems. Um, there are some internal contradictions which are quite hard to explain, and you have to explain away one of the two documents. So um, here, for example, for the 15th of January, it says, um, the, uh, basically says that the three um, uh, Western stars 
uh, were not bigger than the, not the, the space between the three Western stars was not greater than the diameter of Jupiter, i.e. they're all close together, and they were in a straight line. The Florence document there says, and they were not in a straight line. That's a weird contradiction to have between two documents, one of which is supposedly the copy of another. Um, there are also a couple of things here which are just kind of calligraphically, paleographically bizarre. Um, when you write in the 17th century, it's very common to miss out letters and put in little abbreviations. So here we see the word occidentale, and the N is just, it's too boring to write the letter N, so you just put a little line over it. You're, you're saving space. This is a hangover from when parchment was expensive and you wanted to get as much text on as you could, the medieval period. Now we're on much cheaper paper, but people still write in similar ways. Little contraction there. Here, over the letter I, we see the word in. That's I with an N over it. And there's no reason for this to be a skeptical eyebrow instead of a frowny eyebrow, right? That should also just be a little arch over it. So there's a, that's a weird thing that you don't find in 17th century writing. Um, there's also this, this strange uh, contraction. So here we see the word erano, they were. But just as in a modern book, if you found a word hyphenated after a single letter, you say that's, that's a weird wo word processing doc, uh, program that they've used, or a bad editor. You don't want to start a word and then find out what the rest of the word is. You want to have a hint of what the word is. You need at least two or three letters. And everywhere in Galileo's um, manuscripts, when he can, um, hyphenates a word, there's always at least two letters. This is the level of insanity that I descended to, right? That you're <laughs> noticing things like this. You, I'm not going to test you on how many letters Galileo uh, needs before he, he hyphenates. But they're things that make you go, hmm, if you're me. Most bizarrely, though, down in the bottom right of the Ann Arbor document, there are these three diagrams. And as far as I could understand, no historian of astronomy had ever made sense of these. They'd all kind of bluffed and fumbled their way through these. Some people had said, what we're looking at here is not the telescopic observation, but a perpendicular view of the system that Galileo is trying to imagine. And we see a planet and three things. We don't know yet what they are. And one of them, if we um, know how to read what an arrow is, and arrows don't imply motion in diagrams until probably 150 years later. So this is a weird thing to see. This one seems to be moving there, there, and there. But they're all out of line with Jupiter. And it's just very unclear what this little infographic is meant to uh, mean to us. Um, and I always get uneasy when historians of a, a subject can't explain to me in clear prose what it is that they see in a document. So that had always puzzled me. Most bizarrely, though, if we look at the observations for the 10th and 11th of January and then compare them to the observations from the Florence manuscript again, we see that they're just completely different data sets. There's the 10th, there's the 11th. And then if we bring in a historical reconstruction of what was actually in the sky from Padua on the 10th of January 1610 and the 11th of January 1610, and then what was printed in the book, we see this is what you could see. Jupiter, he only sees one of those, but give him a break. He's got a rubbish telescope. And there's the other one. Like, actually really remarkable. Nothing like the Ann Arbor uh, things. The stars are on the wrong side there. And similarly here, within the rel, actually pretty close. Um, and so the Ann Arbor document either has to have made up, fantasized, or falsified data. And why would Galileo do that? This is, as far as we can tell, a private note. Why would he make up data when he doesn't even have the capability at this stage to work out what the data might have been? Like, why would he just put in wrong data? So that made me really quite anxious. At that point, or Thinking through these problems, I thought, well, it's time to find out about not just the intellectual content that's been available to everyone, but let's find out about the materiality of this document. Uh, it's on paper. Paper um, until the early 19th century, when it gets um, made on machines in, in Europe, is all made by hand. And it's made on molds. And on those molds, there are designs 
uh, sewn in in copper wire, which leave marks in the paper where the paper's thinner. They leave uh, kind of stripy lines going both horizontally and vertically. And then there are also little logos or quality marks. They're called they're watermarks. And they will tell you anything from, there's no standardization to them, but they'll either tell you something about the quality of the paper or where the paper was made or how big it is. They don't mean anything. They're arbitrary marks, but they're there and therefore they're useful. So I asked, I, I wrote to Pablo, uh, at which point his heart sank. I didn't realize that until later. It was an innocent request. Could we see watermarks of this, this paper, please? And amazingly, uh, within a day, um, this document had been taken, a light sheet had been put under it, light had been shone through it, and um, this lovely photo came to my email. You couldn't hope for a better uh, relationship with a uh, librarian. What we both saw there was this. This is the watermark. It's faint, but it's legible. There's a circle. There's a bit sticking up and another circle and maybe a couple of other circles. So maybe like an orb with a clover leaf on a stick above or something. And then there are letters. There's an A, there's an S. You're the first people to see this in, in public, okay? Feel very lucky. Tell your grandchildren about this. <laughs> B-M-O. And there was something that immediately struck me about this as peculiar for 17th century paper. 17th century paper doesn't usually have sets of letters on it. It sometimes has one or two letters, but two sets of letters together struck me as a later phenomenon. And I'm not a paper expert, but I just had this kind of nagging feeling that this wasn't right. So I immediately sent this image without saying what text it belonged to, to some people who knew about paper and said, give me a ballpark estimate on the date of this. Just from the presence of letters and the kind of typographic, although that's not quite the right word, the, the type design of these letters. You know, um, the way that letters are made changes over time. What does that B look like? Is that a 16th century B or a 19th century B? And both these paper experts wrote back and said, weird question, but I've had weirder. Um, oh, we, 1780, 1790, 1800. And both of them independently said that. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Okay, that's something we can work with. This is an example of um, Galileo's paper stock in 1609, 1610. These are the papers that he's known to use for writing letters. And you can see they're like six-legged unicorns and hills with crosses on and dragons, lions, not tigers, bears, something rearing up, a crossbow. Uh, here there are some cross keys. Those are the normal kinds of things you get, little kind of iconic images. Now, we have to kind of step sideways because this is a non-linear story. There is no real royal road to finding out about what document, troublesome documents like this are. Um, something about five years earlier had uh, rung in my head. Um, I, somebody had sent me a little YouTube video. I, I don't watch the Antiques Roadshow. I want to make that quite clear right now. Um, <laughs> but somebody had said, hey, did you see there's this, uh, a Galileo letter was brought into the Antiques Roadshow uh, in Austin, Texas in 2015. And I thought, well, that's weird. That doesn't happen very often. And that's what uh, Francis Walgreen said, uh, the, the Christie's expert. He said, that's weird. This has never happened. Nobody brings in a Galileo letter. We're worried that it might be a forgery. Luckily, we've done the background uh, check on this. And it goes all the way back to 1940. So you're clear and um, insure it for $100,000. Uh, I wrote and I said, this seems like we need more information. Can you tell me anything about how to get good images of this or put me in touch with the owner? Um, heard nothing back. And that was a shame. Um, so I had to go through the YouTube, um, freeze framing it and trying to transcribe the letter. And what I found was what some might say Francis Walgreen should have found is that this letter was already known. It was already published, but with a slightly different date. And actually, it's almost identical. It's a, a very close copy to a letter which had been reproduced in facsimile in Galileo's complete works in about the year 1900. So a published text, which uh, the letter had then been lost. It's not the same letter because the, the words are in different places. But every letter form looks exactly the same. And that puzzled me. Why did Galileo write this letter twice? 
like as if he's writing uh, with two hands at the same time. It's not an important letter. It doesn't say anything interesting. Um, and why would he change the date on it? Bizarrely, that letter then uh, showed up. It's now in the Morgan Library in New York. It was given to them uh, by the person who brought it in to the Antiques Roadshow. And, you'll, and, and on the right there, you see the facsimile from 1900. Um, and you might be able to see that, um, it's so that the, the letter, this version starts differently because the start, whatever this original was like, it looks like it lacked its start. It had been torn. But as soon as you get to about uh, V.S. Commandi da me avrai, um, you find uh, che me avrai uh, prossimamente, prossimamente a darli, a darli. You can see that it's pretty much the same, same letter, uh, and then it changes a bit at the end, the date changes, um, but they're remarkably similar. First thing that'll strike you, of course, is the folds on the letter to the left are all wrong. I see someone nodding. That's very impressive. Good. Yes, the folds are wrong. This is how we fold letters, right? We get a letter, we get an envelope, we fold the letter into three, we put it in there because we have envelopes. They didn't have envelopes. They had telescopes, but they didn't have envelopes. <laughs> they would fold a letter um, onto itself uh, with the outside part blank, and that would form the envelope. There was no separate ready-made envelope. So you don't get... Um, letters folded like that in the 17th century. And that just struck me as weird. Maybe someone later posted it like that, but, but just mailed it like that, sorry. Um, but that just struck me as weird. Googling the letters A, S, and B, M, O, as you do, uh, the letters that are on the, wall, the watermark of the, um, of the Ann Arbor document, brought me to this record, the Morgan Library, which amazingly, because they have bags of money, um, allows them to uh, catalogue documents at this level of detail. Letters, BMO, surmounted by a shield, enclosing letters AS. And this is that Galileo letter that had shown up at the Antiques Roadshow. Um, you can see that their record also contains a, an image of the watermark. So let's see what that looks like. So there, A, S, B, M, O, the same double monogram set, different form to the Ann Arbor one, but the same letters. I wrote again to my paper uh, expert friends, everyone needs them, um, and, and said, what does this mean? And somebody came back, well, 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 BMO is obviously an abbreviation for the city of Bergamo near Milan. Um, around the uh, 1760 legislation was um, put into place in Bergamo saying that paper there had to have the letters BMO or Bergamo on it and, um, and then the AS is most probably the initials of the paper maker Antonio something something. So that means that both sheets of paper were late 18th century both the Ann Arbor one and the uh, Morgan one late 18th century made by the same person, so definitely within a generation, and you just see the similarity of the way that they look typographically, or the, the letter forms. They have to be maybe 10, maybe 20 years apart, but not 150 years apart. This document appears in uh, one of the um, strangest reference books ever produced. Uh, I think it's called watermills of the former Austrian-Hungarian Empire. <laughs> uh, if you don't have a copy, it's not available on Amazon. Uh, luckily, Ann Arbor has had a copy. Pablo very kindly went and found it. I got another colleague to go and find it. And we all converged with the same direct hit. Here is that watermark, ASBMO, in this um, kind of three-dimensionally, but very baroque -y. Like it, it feels like Beethoven, not Monteverdi, right? This is late Baroque kind of um, forms, these kind of swirls. They're not Renaissance-y. Uh, not very technical language there. And this watermark appears in documentation in archives in Venice that's securely dated 1790. State, state letters. These watermarks wear out very quickly. Water um, paper makers are making probably about 2,000 sheets of paper a day going in with their mold, 
flipping out the paper, going in again, flipping it out. These things get loose. So a mold needs to be repaired at a minimum every two years. So it's not like a, a mold can be used like maybe a wood block could be for on and on for a, a discrete periods for centuries. So this is a good way of dating um, documents. Now, we know at this point that because of the, the uh, Morgan Library document and the watermark similarity, we know that, and, and the hunch that the Ann Arbor um, watermark is anachronistic, we now know that both of them are on 18th century paper and therefore cannot possibly, unless Galileo also invented a time machine, um, cannot be written in 1607, the Morgan Library letter, and 1609 and 1610, this document. So when were they written? What do we know about where this document came from? Well, here's the earliest trace we've got of it. An American collector from Rhode Island called uh, Roderick Terry uh, put together a vast collection of very nice you know, Shakespeare first folios and um, lots of Robert Burns, some of them forgeries. He doesn't seem to have been very good at spotting forgeries. Um, and a Galileo document. And when he died in, six, in 1934, sorry, um, his entire collection was sold off. And that's where Tracy McGregor bought it for $975, a lot of money. The Shakespeare First Folio went for exactly 10 times that. But this would probably be, in modern terms, pushing a million bucks, I guess, um, or half a million to a million. It's not a cheap document then. And it wouldn't, if, if it weren't for me, it wouldn't be a cheap document now. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so what, what, how is it described? What do we know about it? Well, you'll see at, at the top, you might see, um, it's misidentified. It's, it's claimed to be a letter to Cosmo de' Medici. It's not. It's a, a, the top bit is a letter to Serenissimo Principe. That's actually the Doge of Venice. He hasn't yet got his new patron in Florence. He's working for the Venetians. But the most interesting bit is this passage. A cert certification of genuineness by Cardinal Maffei, Archbishop of Pisa, accompanies the letter written on a visiting card. It attests that Cardinal Maffei has compared the letter with other originals in the collection at Pisa and found it to be authentic. That puzzled me. I had no idea who Cardinal Maffei was. I didn't know what the collection at Pisa was or what, what the comparison was with. So I went rummaging. This is a very slender thread uh, to, to follow through the labyrinth, but it paid off. It turns out that there is a Maffei archive still in Pisa. Um, and when I wrote to them and said, do you know anything about this? They said, well, yeah, we've got, we've got Cardinal Maffei's two Galileo documents. Yeah, we've got them here. We'll send you pictures. Um, Maffei was a, an archbishop. He was head of the uh, Vatican Observatory. He's one of these rare figures in the 1920s in Italy who was both a high-ranking Catholic and an anti-fascist and pro-science. Venn diagram intersection, <laughs> just him. Um, and he, um, he collected Galileos, or rather he was given his two Galileos documents, uh, which formed the, the basis for his authentication of this document. These are those two documents, and you can see that um, both of them are extremely bizarre. Um, this one is pasted or stuck into or written on the end paper of a early 16th century copy of Boccaccio and it's half a letter and the paper's the wrong way round and it makes no sense and it just says like blur de blur blur uh, the 14th of January 1610. So the one night when it's cloudy and Galileo's not looking for a telescope apparently he's sending somebody his hundred year old copy of Boccaccio um, and that's just weird. And this other letter also lacks the start um, uh, and makes some references to texts that don't yet exist according to the date on it in 1606 and also is clearly um, just wrong. Doesn't fit with the other documentation. Where did they come from? Well, Maffey was given them. Uh, here's a letter that accompanied them by a guy called Giovanni Tobaya Nicotra, brackets Drigo. Um, the, this letter says, I'm giving you the Boccaccio book that I 
found while I was rummaging through unnamed booksellers' books, and I saw something poking up underneath a paste down, and I lifted it up, and I saw, so imagine my surprise when I saw it was a Galileo document, and so I'm giving it to you. And then at the end he says, oh, by the way, I have another Galileo document I just found, and I wonder whether you think it's a, ga a genuine Galileo document. And I don't know if he's referring to this or the other letter that he subsequently sells. Now, Nicotra, not a household name, or wasn't until a, a month ago, but um, Nicotra's name I'd already encountered because I'd uh, read an account from the 1930s, a letter where a Galileo collector had said, thank God that that Nicotra's fake Galileo has been uh, withdrawn from sale at Sotheby's. That's all it said. I wrote to Sotheby's and said, do you have any record of fake Galileos from the 1930s? And they didn't know what I was talking about. I thought, dead end there. But that name and that idea that somebody was forging Galileo in the 1930s stuck with me. So when I saw Tobias Nicotra as the donor of um, those two documents to Cardinal Maffei, I uh, thought, OK, well, he didn't just donate them, did he? He made them because um, Nicotra is also a very, very well-known figure, mainly in, uh, amongst musicologists, for forging Handel, Purcell, uh, Pergolesi. About two-thirds of the pieces by Pergolesi are actually by Nicotra. Uh, Mozart, Wagner, you name it, he did it musicologically. He was a failed musician. He says this in his letter to Maff. He says, give me a job, please. Um, I want to write music, I want to teach music, uh, but in the meantime, I have this uh, uncanny habit of finding autograph uh, documents by, <laughs> by people. Now, here we are, uh, this is the New York Times, uh, November 1934. You have to put on the right voice to understand this. Autograph faker gets prison term. <laughs> Nicotro, Swindle Library Congress, convicted in Milan on Toscanini story. Many Americans victims. So at this point, it doesn't make sense otherwise, does it? Um, at this point, uh, he's done too many forgeries. Toscanini's son, Walter, realizes that the Mozart Symphony, his father, Arturo Toscanini, the great uh, conductor, had bought is a forgery. And he tips off the police. The police arrest him for having a fake ID card. Turns out he's been impersonating a dead conductor. That guy, Drigo, that he signs the letter um, as Drigo. Drigo had been dead for two years already. And he goes around touring the US as this dead guy. And nobody bothers to check that. It's kind of weird. Fake news may be a little older than we thought. Um, and a little bit of politics. Um, and in 1934, he's taken to court. His studio is raided. And they find, according to police reports, I haven't actually got my hands on the trial documentation yet because most of it was burnt by an anti-fascist mob at the end of the Second World War um, to destroy the uh, arrest warrants against them, uh, good on them. Um, so uh, all we have is really contemporary journalistic reports. And um, what they found in the study were forgeries being made or finished waiting to go to market of Christopher Columbus, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, I think Machiavelli, Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, you name it, famous Italian, he forged it, Michelangelo. Uh, plus you could get some, um, some Washingtons and some Lincolns, but you know, everyone was doing them at that point. He's sentenced to two years in jail, he's fined millions of dollars. Um, he then appears at Ellis Island about three months later, so he doesn't serve his prison time, and there's a rumor, which may be true, that he's released by the fascists and employed by them in the 30s to forge um, anti-fascist signatures on incriminating documents so that they can be arrested and executed. Um, so there's a weird politics to this story as well. So we know now who did it, or that it's not real. We know that the paper's wrong and why, um, why the paper's wrong. It's a late 18th century paper and not early 17th century paper. But there was this nagging problem that I had. This is the last slide, and then we can um, discuss everything. There was still this problem I had of how did he do it? Not in the sense of did he take a shot of whiskey before? Like, how did he steady his hand? How is it so good? 
Not in that sense. I mean, basically, you can, you can see that he collaged together various texts and, and made very minor improvisational um, adjustments as he went. But how did he have access to the material? That's the kind of mystery here. Um, here's this document. Here's the actual document for the first half of this. Right? This is in the State Archives in Venice. This is not an easy document to get access to. And it would have been even harder in the 1920s or 30s to get access to this, let alone to go in there with a camera and take a picture of it, or let alone to go in there with tracing paper, or um, to sit there for hours and hours and trace out each letter form. It struck me that there was an issue there that of kind of how did he, how did he do it? Turns out that even that is easily and cheaply resolvable. Uh, and might go some way to make us think a little bit about our own digitization attempts. Um, maybe not. In 1893, the great Galileo scholar Antonio Favaro, the editor of Galileo's Complete Works, published a volume um, celebrating Galileo's years at the University of Padua. And it contains this documentary appendix of facsimiles. This was quite a new thing to do in the 1890s facsimiles of original documents so that you as a reader could get a sense of what Galileo's handwriting actually looked like. And it contains both parts. So the Ann Arbor document has at the top this letter to the Doge and at the bottom the um, satellites of Jupiter observation it contains both those parts on different plates. Here's the 1893 facsimile. And so we now know that all Nicotra had to do was go along to a bookshop, buy this single book and he had steal some paper uh, and be a very good forger, and he had the entire tool and skill set required to produce this document that's fooled everyone until uh, we, were, we unmasked it a couple of months ago. That's it. Um, questions, discussion, that kind of stuff. I hope. Yeah, please. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I actually have a couple questions that do for that. Um, so, firstly, uh, uh, Nicoltra, uh, why did he create these forgeries? Uh, I mean, in particular, that, that letter, <laughs> by the, way, right? that, the letter he wrote to uh, Cardinal Maffi seemed almost predatory in a way. Like, it's like he's like trying to lure him into, into having this document, uh, and like he wants him to have it. And I don't really understand the motivation there. So, there's a question about kind of the psychology of forgery, but there's also, um, there's also, uh, I mean, what I've seen in other cases of forgery is that there's a, uh, as a kind of business model, this seems weird, right? You give two away free, maybe in the hope of getting a job. Um, and then there are these two others that appear on the market. My best guess is that he's priming the pump. He's getting Maffey accustomed to him as a source of genuine Galileo stuff. So you start off with very low hanging fruit, boring letters, randomly encountered objects. You know, here's a book that happens to have a little Galileo note. I thought you're the person to take good care of it. You flatter the patron, they become a Galileo collector. Um, and then they have the thing that they can compare against. Uh, and you, you've established a social and a textual relationship. And then you hit with the big object. Like that's the million dollar one. And you're not going to give that to Maffey, but you've got him as an authoritative voice. You've got him on your side. And I think that's how it went. The other scenario might be that he's writing to Maffey so that Maffey writes back so that he has Maffey's handwriting. And it could be, unfortunately, the, the visiting card that accompanied that document is now lost. But it could be that Nicotra forged that as well. Um, we don't know. Um, Maffey dies in 1935, and it might be that that was that the forgery just it, he he seems to be shameless and pretty daring, and maybe that was his business model. Just I'll write to someone so that I can get a handwriting sample back or a visiting card sample back. Um, it seems weird that you would write an authenticating note on a visiting card as well. So my guess is that that might be what what happened, but I think deep down for him it might be politics. I've traced him in the post-war period. He only dies in 1980, Nicotra. It's really weird. When you, you think of him as a 1930s figure and a, a contemporary Mussolini, you think, this guy's never going to make it through the Second World War. Like, <laughs> he's a musicologist fascist. Like, what are his chances? Um, 
And then he shows up in Mexico City in 1960 uh, and dies in 1980. I don't know whether he carries on forging. I really want him to carry on for, I, I shouldn't say that, but I really want, uh, and, and I think that he also prints books and writes articles about Italy in the 1930s that are deeply nostalgic. And I think that he's a um, committed fascist and has this idea that he can forge history into the shape it should have been. Both the 17th, which is kind of scary, right? This, but it's an intellectual and political agenda as well as a financial one. He's only really, or mainly doing Italians. He's celebrating the great history of like Columbus and stuff like that. It's about national pride. It's about Italian genius. Um, and it's about um, screwing over the Library of Congress. It's also about um, undermining authority else, uh, elsewhere, I think. Thank you. Well, I have as well, I'll Let's come back yeah. if we. <laughs> I'm just going to ask what the Morgan Library is saying or doing. Pablo, do you want to answer that? Or not? Sorry, could you repeat the question? The Morgan Library? Mm -hmm. What's the status of that? Uh, well, uh, that's a very good Why question. Yeah, initially, what we wanted to do is to have. Uh, when it was clear that it was a forgery. Uh, I mean, the process took like a month, you know, back and forth. And of course, as you saw, the Morgan document is like, that's it, you know, clearly. So we tried to do a sort of joint announcement, Michigan and Morgan, uh, to have like a, you know, I mean, we could probably have thoughts you know, about the details, but I don't think they were willing to do so. Uh, and I don't know whether they are going to do it. I don't know if you have heard anything lately. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, I think uh, we found ourselves like, you know, going all the way in terms of uh, communication, you know, talking to newspapers. And, uh, but I don't think that there was anything from the Morgan. Clearly, I mean, the evidence is from them. Uh, of course, our document is more important in terms of, uh, I mean, what it claimed to be, as opposed to the content of that uh, letter. That's true. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, this document uh, wasn't uh, just, you know, in an exhibit case. I, mean, I was using this document for years for, you know, uh, exhibit, you know, with students. And uh, if you think about when well, 1938, so how many stories we have been telling about the, the moons of Jupiter. So uh, clearly, it, it had a different dimension. However, I I regret that they didn't want to to have you know the same kind of open attitude as we we did. So if I could, if I, I, if I could pose a question, uh, I mean, Nick, you touched on this to some extent, but I'd just love to hear from both of you a little bit more about your interactions and about the process that you uh, that you went through, um, uh, reflections on it, and and, and your, your heart sinking, for instance, right. <laughs> Pablo. Right? Actually, that was uh, the, the, the first the New York Times journalist wanted to know whether I had a heart attack in the big news. Uh, I remember the date exactly, May 17th, uh, I think that was it, that was the, uh, and I mean, you said, uh, Nick, um, that of course, you know, there were clearly some suspicions, and, and of course I knew uh, his work, I mean, the team was uh, Nick Wilding, Galileo, and you know, several questions about the uh, mentioned the bottom mark, also the problem. So my reaction was like, okay, so I was pretty, pretty worried, to be honest. And then, you know, all, those, all the stories about the Galileo letter came back to me, right? Okay, so what do we do with that? We cannot erase it. Because um, you start thinking about the worst possible uh, scenario. So my first reaction was, you know, my, my heart sank, of course, and also, okay, yeah, and uh, I, I, I remember that I contacted you, Kathy Baker, the following day or probably the same day, uh, 
to check the document, the watermark, uh, I sent the, the I took the, the, a picture of the watermark, I sent it to uh, to me, and I sent the document to our uh, conservation lab to, to start a few uh, you know, analysis uh, of, the, of, the, of the manuscript. So from so that moment, you know, I had this sort of, you know, half of me, you know, but to be professional, you have to, you know, you have to actually it's also, I wanted to know. I mean, you have these emotions that, I mean, first it's like, oh, I hope nothing is going to happen. I hope this is going to be just some, but at the same time, it's like, okay, after, particularly after a few days, you really start looking at the, the, the document as somebody who really want to know the truth, the, the, mm -hmm. you know, what, yeah, what is going you. to happen. So I think, uh, um, I don't know, uh, maybe I am sort of, you know, the emotions are, you know, kind of, uh, particularly the first week was very hard, but you know, with time, I think uh, it helped, like, you know, our communication was always, I think, very fluid, yeah. very kind of straightforward, honest, and that, that, that was very helpful, uh, I think, uh, so. Yeah, just like, to, um I mean, the, the nightmare from the re researcher's point of view coming in with kind of doubts is that there's just going to be a wall's going to go up or this thing's going to go away for restoration for an undisclosed <laughs> period of time. And, um, and this was what actually happened here. Not, I mean, in initially, because Pablo uh, made all the, the right calls, but also that those calls went up through every level of the institution. There was, uh, you know, I, I'd, we'd, we'd have these conversations, sometimes like five emails a day of just like, and then periods of silence when we were both going off doing, doing other research or our own research, and then we come back and reconvene. And then there's one where it's like, we're gonna have a meeting to talk about this. And I was like, uh, I drew up a kind of document of the things that I'd found to say what, what I thought it was. But I realized even at that point, they could just be, denial, pushback, um, you no longer have access to this document, it's not yours, like we choose who, who gets to talk about it. I wasn't sure at that point still whether the whether there was 100% or whether I was on like 90% or whether, you know, whether I was being so vain that because I had 15 minutes of fame once for finding forgeries that if I, I was convinced that it, wherever I looked I could find them or I didn't know if I was getting it all wrong. Um, and so what, what we had was this just, I thought really kind of beautifully, um, a model relationship of what, how a librarian and a historian should work together to establish a truth. And that institutionally that happened. Now, I also had that with the Morgan Library, the uh, Philip Palmer, the curator of uh, literary and historical manuscripts, very, very open, gave me images similarly. But then there was an, a, I, I don't know if this is talking out of turn, but there seems to have been a kind of institutional failure not to go the extra mile there and say, right, what do we do now? Right, it's not enough, and they haven't even, if you look up this letter, you still seem to see the same um, cataloging that was up there. They, they've just, uh, they're not denying it, but they're just, it's complete inaction. It could be that they're a, an institution with a lot of stuff going on all the time, but um, and they just haven't got around to it yet. But it seemed like a missed opportunity. They could have shared the um, shared the resources, sh done a shared announcement, kind of shared some of the responsibility about uh, how to deal with this document. And I just feel like uh, Michigan really took the lead, and um, other institutions. And this has happened with with other institutions, with other scenarios as as, as well, other documents that it's, this isn't the obvious way to go for an institution. Uh, this is a moral choice. And, and that's kind of, and it's an important moral choice. And, it's, and this kind of culture of transparency um, has, has to become, oh, I'm choking up, sorry, uh, has to become the, the norm. And it's not, and that's a problem. Any on, no, okay. No online questions yet, yes, please. Well, this is the first time I've actually seen it. 
Um, and I haven't, I haven't really got in close. As far as I could see from uh, the lab report, um, it looks as though it's written with a quill, as far as we can tell, and it looks as though it's following a proper recipe. I did have a, I still don't know, I had an initial reaction from the digital image. So this was, all my stuff was digital image plus what I could ask, ask Pablo. Um, I had a query why a document written five months apart, so top half is August 1609, bottom half is January 1610, why the ink and the quill should look as though it's, it's written at a single setting. If you compare that with the Florence manuscript, you see the, the ink changes every night as he comes back and writes in the next thing, which to my mind argues for that document's absolute primacy, that it's, it's a composite, uh, serial, serially composed document. This should have at least two, but po probably 15 different, or whatever, however many nights there are, plus the, the top of There should be differences in there. And those didn't jump out at me, but I wasn't sure as well. You have to be careful about what's an artifact of digitization and photography and what's, uh, what's um, actually there. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting a closer look and seeing whether that was a real thing or, or just my imagination. It seemed a strong argument against this authenticity uh, for it to be so uniform. Austin, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, so you kind of think like how many of these are out there and you know, once we know about them, do they earn their place back on the shelf with a different story? Right now, we, we don't know. It doesn't give us so much insight into Galileo, but now it gives us you know, some fun insights into you know, like a 19th, early 20th century you know, county fashion. Like what, what's going on in their mind and what motivates them in their daily life? Like, do you think this is kind of re its place? Well, I guess, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, initially, uh, uh, the document was going to be part of an online exhibit about early astronomy, so I had to remove it. Uh, and actually, one of the professors I, w I was working uh, with you know, for this exhibit, she, uh, she said, well, include it in the exhibit. You know, it's a nice document, but I thought, well, this belongs to, there's a, a new dimension now for this letter. We, we shouldn't really confuse you know, the different uh, contexts, uh, so to speak. So uh, I think, uh, I mean, what we are doing now is one example of what this document uh, could actually uh, be useful for. I mean, probably some of you have heard about the importance of watermarks for the first time. Uh, what a teaching tool that could be for uh, students to learn about uh, primary sources. Uh, not only uh, manuscripts like this, but also early printed books. Uh, so, uh, I think it could be, uh, for instance, you know, I will probably continue using this this uh, document for my teaching, uh, you know, to, uh, for instance, you know, questions about ink. Uh, that could be, uh, it is tricky because uh, I did also research about uh, any uh, conservation treatment we did in the past uh, with this letter. So we actually clean the, the letter and, uh, more than 10 years ago. So when there is a conservation treatment involved, you know, those questions about ink of different uh, tonality because it was actually applied at different times could be eliminated, you know, sort of uniform. So to answer your question, uh, also there is a possibility. Can I, can I correct you? Sorry? For a moment, it was not conserved 10 years ago. Maybe it was more than only remounted. There was absolutely no treatment that was done on it. It was more uh, before you remounted, it was actually sent uh, to, um, I don't remember the name of this company. So it wasn't done by us. Oh. It is actually in the, ar uh, in the archival um, database of conservation lab. So then it came back, uh, uh, and then you put the, the new mountain as it is now. So I'm talking, of, I said 10 years, but it was more than, more than the, the years. So one, one example of something that I, I may do with the letter, I mean, I have been asked to do an exhibit with portraits in general. I mean, we have some, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a highlight that they, they, they were, they were forgeries, I mean, they are forgeries. So that could be a possibility, you know, 
to take this letter, I mean, this document in this sort of new dimension, 20th century um, fortress. We have, we have an online question, yeah. Andrew. Um, have there been any, based on these findings, have there been any inquiries about other Galileo works? Do you anticipate that other Nicotra forgeries will be coming forth in the near future? Uh, there's been a weird la lack of uh, inquiry into the Morgan document, um, to the extent that Francis Walgreen uh, apparently didn't know until a couple of years, uh, days ago. Uh, there's a, a, a follow-up podcast that will be coming out with the Antiques Roadshow. It's called Detours, is that it? Something like that? Yeah. Um, where they will tell him live that this was a forgery. Um, <laughs> So that could be, uh, s that might be worth listening to. Um, I don't know, what I'm, I'm trying to work out, um, is it, so you have this peculiar timing. Um, in Galileo scholarship, Antonio Favreau uh, does this 21 volume edition of the, the works of Galileo. There are, um, uh, six volumes of correspondence, something like 4,000 letters to Galileo, from Galileo, and about Galileo. It's monumental. Um, Galileo was very, very assiduous in keeping his own archive of, of correspondence. Um, and so you have, uh, you have a large quantity of known Galileo documents, and they're published. After that publication, there's a revision when new documents uh, that have come up, and there aren't very, very many, maybe another um, 50 documents that have subsequently resurfaced because of that publication get, get printed. And then just five years ago, there was a new supplement to the supplement, which is everything we've discovered since Favreau's edition, which is another 100 letters, maybe. Um, and most of those are kind of tangential. I don't think there are any Galileo autographs in that category. What I'm trying to think of is, A, whether um, the publication facilitates forgery, because the publication contains all these facsimiles, facsimile signatures, facsimile of individual documents. Like, basically, it gives you a great data set of the kinds of phrases Galileo used. You could Frankenstein together a nice little document and then take samples of handwriting um, and make that. But it also provides the forger with a potential opportunity that uh, you know exactly where everything the Galileo wrote is and you can work out um, what the backstory could be about your document that then resurfaces. And it doesn't seem that Nicotra was particularly thoughtful or adept at backstories. There's not even a grandma's, grandma's attic. Uh, as far as I can tell. It's just like, here's something I found. It's Italy. Um, I, mean, I mean, presumably, and, and I mean, in the 1930s, and well, especially in the 40s and 50s, when Italian cultural institutions in the uh, post-Second World War period are uh, basically ransacked, and American dealers are unscrupulous in asking about, they don't ask about provenance at all. They'll, you see, this is going on thin ice, isn't it? But um, lots and lots of uh, high-end Copernicus or Galileo or Newtons that, um, or less Newton, but books that had been in I Italian, especially church libraries, um, show up in, Ita in American private and then subsequently institutional collections with like huge bleach marks where there was clearly a watermark. Or even the library stamp is still there, University of Chicago talking to you. You have a Sidereus Nuncius, which has a large library stamp saying uh, that this belonged to the um, Pontifical, um, uh, a, a Pontifical University. That collection went to Bologna University. Bologna University has a card catalog saying they had a Sidereus Nuncius, and it went missing in 1954. And they have a whole file of news clippings about this guy who's suspected of stealing this thing. It's the same copy. I put Chicago in touch with Bologna University. Chicago basically said, we got better lawyers, <laughs> right? So these conversations, it's not, just about, um, it's not just about forgeries. It's about cultural restitution as well. 
uh, and it's about the politics of cultural restitution, and it's about um, it's about uh, you know what happened in post-war Europe and um, and what to do about it, uh, as well as in other other places. I mean, it's not as serious as the questions that are raised so beautifully in the um, in the art gallery here about, say, the Benin bronzes, but it's a similar kind of question, and similar kinds of responses should be being thought of in libraries. And as far as I can see, we're not yet having those conversations. So the more times we can um, hold these things up to a water, uh, up to a light, either to see a watermark or to see the truth, the the better. Did I see a hand over here? Yes. L little louder, please. Sorry, you talked about how he had access to letters and stuff to copy, but I'm wondering if you had any idea where you can see this 18th century. Right, good question. So I, I think it's his big, his big, so n the question for those of you who couldn't hear, the paper's old, right? He's not, he's not an idiot. He's not like pouring cups of tea like a kid would do on <laughs> printer paper and singeing it with a candle and saying, here be treasure, right? He's... <laughs> The paper's old, it's just nowhere near old enough. My guess is, and at his trial, this is reported in, in the papers, librarians at the Brera, one of the big libraries in Milan, say, we know this guy, he used to come in and rip out end papers from books. Now, um, can I show you an end paper? I'm not gonna rip it out. Um, so, uh, here's a Sidereus Nuncius. Um, and, uh, here's the cover. The cover is not 17th century, right? The cover's 20th century. This sheet here is an end paper. This is not part of the printer's material. This is part of the bookbinder's material. And as such, when uh, the cover gets, um, when this piece of paper, which is here only to take the wear of opening the book, when this gets ripped or damaged, it can be replaced. Or when the book gets a new cover, this can be replaced. And what I think Nicotra probably did was went into the Brera, ordered up historically correctly dated documents, like I'm going to forge a 1607 today, I'll order up a book from around 1607 because the paper will be 1607, and then he ripped out the end paper and what he didn't realize that the end papers had been replaced with, in the late 18th century with locally sourced, i.e. Um, Bergamo paper, and if he'd been a better bibliographer, he'd have never made that mistake. <laughs> right? So that's the take home message. Learn your bibliography before you get into, into forgery. But, oops, I, I dropped the mic. But I, I think that's his, um, that's his MO. And related to that, actually, there was a lot of luck in, um, so you'll have understood that the Morgan uh, document basically deauthenticates the Ann Arbor document. Without that, we'd have still been maybe going back and forth saying, I don't know, here's an example of a three-letter monogram from 1620. They could, like we, it wouldn't have been that secure a, um, a piece of evidence. But with the, um, with the Morgan letter, there's no way that, that the Ann Arbor one can be, um, can be genuine. That was very, very lucky. All the other Nicotra forgeries that I've got my, haven't got my hands on, but got images of watermarks, have completely different watermarks. So I think he just um, was on a Galileo early 17th century day and went and happened to get two Bergamo uh, 18th century sheets. Um, but that, that's the other lesson, vary where you source your paper from probably as well. <laughs> or at least try and replicate it to, to make it match. The, what he should have done is gone into the Galileo archives, taken out a blank sheet from there, and then there would be no way of knowing. What a horrific thought. In the back there? Yeah. I'm just really curious. So I, I know the, the loss to kind of culture and the history of science is heartbreaking, but I'm curious to be so crass, what kind of financial impact does this have on institutions when a document like this suddenly goes from being essentially priceless to less than priceless? I'm curious. Well, it, it, yeah, that's a very good question. Well, in this case, it was a gift. I mean, we didn't yeah. pay uh, anything for it, but still, uh, is it's something that I haven't done yet because we have uh, a risk manager uh, person who uh, deals with uh, you know the artifacts in terms of the insurance. 
you know, if anything happens, you know, like, you know, you decide to, to burn now on the spot, you know, one of the, so, I mean, I am not encouraged you to, uh, that you do that, but, you know, that's a sort of situation. Now about something that you buy, and uh, if you pay for it, and you discover that it is something that is not what it claimed to be, I am not sure, I am learning ab about this. I mean, this is the first time I encountered this situation, so uh, it has been a very intensive you know, learning experience for me, and I, I would have to, now I, I have to, to double check, I mean, what's going on in terms of, you know, if I buy something that it, it is not real uh, historical material, mm -hmm. so. Just the insurance alone, that that question. Yeah. Another, another question from online? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so is there any part of you that's sad when you made the discovery of a portrait? Or is it this sort of excitement that I figured you out? Um, I read somewhere that the English are the only people who, who feel schadenfreude for themselves. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's an answer. Uh, I get it. I mean, it's this, it's a it's a very mixed it's a very mixed emotion because uh, yeah, part of you is like I'm the annoying kid who sees how the magician it was up his sleeve all along. Like you're there saying I know how you did it, and part of you wants to believe in the magic. So um, and I'm I'm sad for the institution, but I'm also like you know I I feel like being here now and having these conversations, like we've, we're doing the right, the right thing doing this. So my emotions don't really, really matter. But I do feel a little bit like gleeful when I'm like, yes, <laughs> nobody else has ever noticed that. Like, and that's, that's similar to, I mean, it is a, a form of historical research like any other form of historical research, like identifying the hand of that early letter of Galileo. I'm like, no one else has other, ever realized that. I can make an argument from this. Um, I don't enjoy the, um, the kind of cultural desecration part of it, although I do, I mean, my colleagues call me the angel of death, um, because wherever I go, it's like things just turn to cinders around me. But I, I do think it's also interesting to think about like the culture of autograph collecting in early 20th century America and like why why these things matter and why they're valued so so much. Like, is there a fetishism of, of the autograph object going on as well? And what happens to an object when that balloon bursts? Does the entire history written on it also disappear? What do we do with that history? And there are some, some pretty tricky questions. There's a, there's a related set of documents I'm working on. Um, Galileo's considerations on the poet Tasso which are basically the foundation of uh, a brilliant article by the art historian Erwin Panofsky, where he makes this claim that Galileo's poetry appreciation is linked to his cosmology. And he says that because, uh, because of Galileo's relationship to mannerism, he couldn't stand mannerist poets, and therefore he couldn't stand mannerist forms like el ellipses. And so he liked circles and uh, classical poetry, and they go together. They're a kind of uh, a whole epistemological uh, toolkit. It's an amazing article. I think that I went back and looked at the considerations on Tasso, and I don't think they have anything at all to do with Galileo. I've yet to write that up, but the big question is, well, what do we do with the entire school, the, the discipline of visual epistemology, which is huge now in the history of science, thinking visually. It's clearly a really interesting thing to be thinking about, but what happens if one of the foundation articles is based on thin air? Does the whole building then fall? Do bits of it fall? What, what do we do about that as historians? It's a kind of ethical question as well as a, a, a practical one. Do we just ignore it and say everyone has a bad day? Or do we say like the foundations are not secure we can't carry on building that. And I, I genuinely don't know what to do about, about those kinds of uh, problems. And they're related to the, to the question of, what is this object now? What do we do with this object? Um, is it real in a different way? Is it valuable in a different way? Uh, if it engenders conversations about um, historical method and um, archival practice and librarianship, 
then it is valuable. It's in some ways more valuable now than it was before. Before it was a kind of uh, simulacrum of itself. You know, it was just like it was a trophy piece. Now it's real. That's a weird thing to say about a forgery. <laughs> well, I'd say you're teaching caution to buyers uh, at every level, especially with internet buying. Uh, you want to be very cautious, and it is useful to pay, pay with a credit card who might be backing <laughs> you up if you're buying something dubious or unproven or bigger. Or go to the good dealers who will stand by their, their word and guarantee, you know, if not as described, refund. Yes. Not everyone does that, but some do. And that should be on your invoice when you receive it. Yeah. And insist in the way that museums are now insisting, um, you know, where's the provenance trail? If there isn't a provenance trail, then I don't want to have it. Right. Um, you know, museums, you can't donate your fake Pollocks anymore. Um, and that's a, that's, that degree of transparency is good because it is cutting down on uh, looting and thefts and illegal excavations and all the things that have got, that appear in the culture pages every week of the Geddes found another of its Roman busts is, is stolen. Like, well, there are ways around that. It's asking where was this 50 years ago? Where was this 100 years ago? Um, yeah, I'm on a real uh, soapbox today, sorry. <laughs> I think we can do one more question. Did you? Well, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't recall if you said the Morgan purchased um, is, or was it donated? It was donated as well. Okay. And I think that they might have felt that it, or they, they asked me to uh, give them time to break the news to the donor, which I think is totally reasonable. The donor then called me up and he said, like, that's amazing. That's, that's a great story. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I was going to get chewed out. But I mean, he, he just said, like, you know, we came by this. It was a great thing to have. And now we know what it really is. And I don't know what happens, though, to the, if there was a tax write-off for the value of that. And that's interesting. Had they purchased it, what would their response have been? Different? Yeah, well, yeah, interesting. I don't know. We will probably find out on the uh, Antiques Roadshow podcast. <laughs> Okay, for the last, sir, do you want to ask your second question? Yeah, yeah. it's kind of related to uh, one of the other questions that was asked about, um, you know, like the culture around auto autographs and these kind of texts. But like, why do you think it took uh, the, U the university library to discover this? Like, was it just kind of like eagerness to possess something, such a crucial document like Galileo, or was there just a lack of caution taken in handling it? After that? Or was it that good of a forgery? I think in 1938, people were not looking that closely at watermarks. Um, and and Nicotra definitely wasn't looking closely at watermarks. I mean, this, this is another take home message that forgeries also reveal the bibliographical tools of the, of the time, right? Because forgery is about um, convincing someone enough. It's not about a perfect simulacrum down to the subatomic level. Um, it's unless, you know, Blade Run or whatever. Uh, it's about. Um, ticking all the boxes that are currently available. And so that's another reason why they're great teaching tools, because you get to see not only what's wrong with it, but what was right with it in the 20s. And at that point, you realize, huh, maybe paper study wasn't, wasn't and, and you, you see this, I mean, there are, um, the best example of this is uh, a wonderful book by, um, ah, the Scarinth of Scornello, Ingrid Rowland, um, did this book about 17th century forgeries. Actually, somebody who knew Galileo. This guy who had made some ancient Etruscan time capsules and buried them around his ground. And then he'd walk around with cardinals and say, oh, I just stubbed my foot on something. <laughs> what, what, oh, it's a time capsule. Let's break it open. And there were letters written, I think bilingually, in Latin and Etruscan saying, Oh, the Romans are coming, but first, let me tell you something about Etruscan life. And there were this kind of hoax, um, but, but then they got taken seriously, and then the guy kind of realized he'd really get in trouble if he said they were a hoax, so he claimed that they were real. These things survive, and they're on 17th century Dutch paper, right? and they're meant to be first century texts. And you, you just realize 
for anybody to take this. It just meant that paper was not a historical object at that, at that moment in time. It didn't have a history. It was transparent. Um, so there, uh, I've meandered from your original question, but that was, that was where I went. I forgot, no, yeah, sorry. I think, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's, it wasn't so much about like, any, any lack of like, uh, like a, like a conscious effort to like, it was just a lack of technology. And, like, For instance, the definite uh, evidence, you know, the catalog you mentioned that, I, you know, I remember that you sent an email you were waiting for the catalog to come to Georgia State University by Tilabri Law. So I, I think I was the fastest li librarian <laughs> ever to climb the, the set of the stairs to get it. That catalog is much later. It's from the 1960s. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't have that particular information at that time. Right. You know? So and it, it, this watermark thing is an ongoing work. I mean, all the time we have more, you know, digital databases, you know, increasing the, the number of watermarks available for us to, to, to check, so to speak. But it's also an underfunded resource, so it's very patchy. There are huge gaps, and there's no, um, you know, if you're searching, one of the basic sources is this French one called Briquet, and you have to know, like, what French for a unicorn standing on one leg is to find the image of it. Like, it's, it's uh, everything's language filtered. It's the kind of thing where it would make so much sense for somebody to do a massive digitization project of just an image uh, an image search and, and then also for it to become the norm for digitization of documents that watermarks are also included with dimensions and, and done on a standardized tech. It'll never happen. But, you know, this is about the, what? It's happening right now. It's happening right now? In Europe particularly, there's a website called the Memory of Paper. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Bernstein Project and lots of different companies are doing exactly that. They're documenting watermarks And, and to be fair as well to Francis Walgreen on the Antiques Roadshow, that one appears in a frame and presumably he wasn't encouraged to take it out and hold it up to the light and look at it. What's weird there is that in the workflow at the Morgan, when they took their uh, beta radiograph of it, the presumably just the labor division there meant that that image was never seen by somebody who thought like the, that doesn't match the date of the document. Um, and so there needs to be also not a false matching of metadata with image. There needs to be a quality check going on. Otherwise, you'll get false records w that can then um, authenticate other documents. So it's kind of complicated at l a, l a kind of workflow level as well. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Well, Nick and Pablo, thank you so much for, uh, for a wonderful discussion and presentation. <laughs> Great opportunity. I want, to thank, I want to thank Andrew for monitoring the YouTube and the Michigan media team. And I just want to quickly alert you to a couple of upcoming events. Uh, a week from today, we have our Mich Making Michigan series continuing with Deirdre de la Cruz from the U of M History Department, who is going to talk about the U of M Philippines collections that are spread across numerous museums and libraries uh, and the problematic ways in which some of those collections were, were obtained during the US colonial period. Uh, and the current Reconnect, Recollect project to address that history. So uh, please check our website for that. Uh, and in two weeks, we have movie night here, and this is directly related to the topic tonight. We are going to show the documentary, uh, what's the name of it again? Uh, the Moving Earth, uh, which uh, looks at uh, the early history, the early modern history of astronomy uh, from uh, 
uh, from, well, I guess it's from, well, from uh, Tycho Brahe through Copernicus and Bruno and Kepler and Galileo and Newton. So if you're more interested in sort of the history behind Galileo, then that's a great documentary to come see. And as always, when we're here, if we can, uh, the observatory is open and we also will look at the, we'll look at the, look at the, uh, look at the heavens. So thank you all very much. Uh, I don't think we're going to be doing any observing, is that right? But I think Austin in just a minute can explain some other things we have going. Those of you online, I hope you'll join us in person sometime. And of course, there are the, uh, uh, the, documents, here, uh, the, the uh, documents here up on the table to look at. So thank you all very much.